All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone here. My name is John Mora. I'm the VP of Data Science here at Zephyr. Uh, and we host these meetups every now and then to bring leaders in machine learning and data science here to talk. And today we have one such leader. So this is Brad Allen. He's the chief architect at Elsevier, the uh, publishing platform. So for everyone in here that has been in academia like myself, I'm sure we've all heard of Elsevier and either contributed to some of their journals and certainly, certainly read them. Um, and so he's going to talk today about content publishing and data solutions via machine learning. Uh, Brad is currently the chief architect at Elsevier, where he leads um, their technology organization focusing on driving technology, technology visions and roadmaps in collaboration with corporate strategy. Uh, prior to Elsevier, Brad was the founder and CTO of several software startups in the LA area with two successful exits. Uh, so with that, I'd like to all welcome Brad. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and, uh, and thanks everybody for uh, coming. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we've been doing at Elsevier in the area of machine learning. Um, I really wanted to kind of use this as an opportunity to talk to a group that is focused and interested in the topic um, and get some feedback from you, honestly, with regard to how you see what it is we're doing and the kinds of things that we're trying to tackle mapping to you know, concerns you see in the areas in which you've been applying the technology or taking a look at the technology as well. So welcome interaction uh, as we go through the talk at any, 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 any particular time. Um, so um, how many out there, I mean, uh, John mentioned that he, he's familiar with our company, but how many of you uh, know who Elsevier or what Elsevier is as a company? Okay, how many of you consider us to be an evil company? Okay, we've got a couple of people there, all right? So I'm just trying to, trying to understand my audience, okay, a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a company that is way out on the low, you know, sort of the, the, the thin end of the tail in terms of corporate longevity. Actually, the company has been around for 140 years or thereabouts. Uh, and uh, for most of that time, it has been a publishing firm. And uh, it's kind of interesting to see what has happened over uh, the period of time that I've been involved with the company. I, this is my 10th year there, um, which is an unfathomably long time. But um, it's been interesting and exciting for reasons I hope you'll see as I go through the talk here. But we have, you know, the, the sort of the, um, the, the interesting history that at one point we were considered to be roadkill for the internet. In fact, as you can see in this quote from this article from Forbes from December 95, we were declared to be the first victim of the internet, okay, because of the fact that we were a publisher and scientists and technologists were very familiar with and interested in using the internet to publish and you know, people didn't see the company being able to make that transition very well or very effectively in as short of time as, as ultimately we did. Um, in the time that has transpired uh, since uh, 1995, we've moved from a company where 20% uh, of our revenue is essentially online sales and 80% in print to today where it's the print portion of our revenue is dropping below 20% and the rest of it is basically digital. And that's not just traditional journals, academic journals, books, print materials and, and, and their digital instantiations and PDF. It's um, a variety of things that increasingly are becoming the focus of the company, which is essentially data solutions where we're taking information that is being passed through us through the publishing process and using that to derive additional value and provide guidance to people in the decision making that they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis as professionals uh, who are our customers. So the transition has really been this from this, this, this notion of providing people and packaging knowledge and information in a way where we're giving it to them to read and absorb uh, as scholars, as researchers, as medical professionals, to ones where you know, we jumped online and made it possible for us to be able to use internet technologies to search that body of knowledge and get things in a more of a just-in-time, cut-to-fit basis. 
the step we're taking now is to really move the company in a direction where the primary focus in the long run is the delivery of information and data solutions, where we're providing just-in-time advice and guidance to people in the various contexts and tasks that they find themselves performing day in, day out as researchers and medical professionals. Um, the business that we have really addresses um, these five constituencies. We've got um, clinicians, that is people providing care uh, in the hospital um, who are looking to get answers to questions about what the appropriate treatment is for a patient that's currently under their care. There are researchers, that is, the folks who are in universities or in industrial research organizations who are trying to understand you know, how to wrap their head around a particular topic or subject matter for them to be able to, to make progress in their research. Um, governments use data that we produce to make decisions about where they should be investing in research. And similarly, institutional managers at universities use uh, data solutions that we're providing to be able to uh, help them make decisions about where they place their investments. I mean, what academics should I go out and hire? What departments are, are uh, moving forward and stellar in terms of the way in which they're contributing to the fields they're focused on? We have pharmaceutical companies as customers who are really trying to do research toward the end of producing uh, drugs or other kinds of treatments or devices. Um, and we have um, uh, nursing students as a constituency. About half the nursing students in the United States use our systems and technology to make sure that their understanding of the topic matter that they have to pass their certification exams on is something that they have under, under control. And that's woven into the fabric of how, um, you know, the institutions that um, teach nursing uh, are really kind of making sure that their student bodies are passing muster and going through uh, the process of learning directly. All of those things, you know, are really uh, targeted by a, a wide range of different uh, products that we have. But if you wanted to try to sum up what it is that our customers are really struggling with moving forward, it really kind of comes down to these four things. We have, you know, in the upper left-hand corner, um, you know, global research spend is, is huge. When you talk about the United States, Europe, China, India, uh, the rest of the world, it's about, it's close to two trillion uh, and growing roughly um, you know, somewhere between two and four percent a year. That's a tremendous amount of effort that's producing a tremendous amount of knowledge that traditionally is written down in articles and submitted to journals or conferences. And once it's kind of baked in for a while, ultimately turned into textbooks for people to learn from. Um, it turns out that we have some real problems with science today in terms of issues like reproducibility or fraud. Um, you know, it turns out that when you get down to it, as people begin to move away from working with print and working with digital technologies to be able to actually conduct and, and measure and access research, a lot of the stuff that we assumed was reproducible in people's research turns out not to be so, uh, or not to be very reproducible. And that's a huge problem. Um, drugs, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar in terms of, you know, those of you who have dealt with this sort of thing in your own personal health care, you know, they're very expensive to develop. They're very expensive to be able to uh, uh, get to the point of delivery, and the success rate is not very good. It's about one out of 20. And this is something that was pointed out to me recently uh, by uh, the head of our uh, healthcare technology group. Um, and I did not, I was not aware of this. Medical error, that is somebody who could have or should have known the right thing to do in a given situation, but didn't, or did something that was incorrect, that they had the knowledge at hand to be able to, to do the right thing. That turns out to be the third largest cause of death uh, in the United States uh, after heart disease and healthcare. I mean, heart, heart well, healthcare, right? Heart disease and uh, cancer. Um, and that's stunning to me. Um, the issue there is really one of people who should know what to do, not having effective access to the knowledge that others should be able to share with them to make those right decisions. So these are all 
challenges that our customer are facing, what we have at hand to try to address meeting those challenges in the various products and services that we're providing is really content and technology. And the focus that we have within the technology organization at Elsevier is how to combine those things together to drive these data solutions. Um, you know, we have uh, data associated with things like, you know, chemistries, chemistry and drugs, um, you know, about 16% of the world's research and data and, uh, and, you know, and journal and book publications is actually something that we, we produce. Um, we've got about 35,000 published books that really capture for each discipline that they're focused on a lot of what stands for the received wisdom of the workers that have gone on and drive, uh, driven knowledge in those areas. Um, on the technology side, we have a lot of technologists. That number is a little uh, uh, old. We're about 1,200 people now at this point working on a variety of ap different applications where we're using technologies like machine reading, semantic enhancement, machine learning, collaborative filtering to build these applications to derive and produce these data solutions for folks. So this is what we're working with and what we're working on. Um, and uh, over the last several years, we've been trying to understand, as we make this pivot from being a content publisher to being a data solutions provider, how do we reduce the time to market to be able to produce new applications for our customers that solve these various kinds of decision-making uh, problems that they have? Um, what is it that we can do to not only reduce the time to market, but make it faster for us to be able to understand what opportunities there are hidden in the content that the technology can bring to bear on producing new applications. So this is a, just really a very simple schematic process of how we are starting to think about building applications. We used to think about applications in silos. We have a search thing called Science Direct. We have a, a, an index of you know, authors and citations and publications called Scopus. Um, you know, we bundled those things up, they were built in silos, and there wasn't a lot of data sharing and commonality between those things. What we're in the middle of doing as we reinvent ourselves from being that kind of company focused on specific siloed products to being a data platform in essence for science and medicine is trying to think about things in terms of how we go through this process. What is, it, what is the question that somebody is trying to answer in a particular context? You know, with the information of what the use case is, driving the notion of what the task is, who are the persona involved, and so forth. We're asking product managers to describe then what is the data that you need to be able to produce the answer to that question. And then we go and look at what is the data that we have at hand. If we've got the data that can be used to derive and produce that answer, then great, let's just reuse that. Okay, if it requires additional processing or some kind of computation to be able to mine information out to produce the data in the form that is needed to answer that question, then we go and create that off of the data that we have. But in a lot of cases, we don't necessarily have the data that we need. And in those cases, we have to understand where is it out there in the broad world? How do we access that? And how do we bring that in for us to be able to build solutions out on top of it? I show this diagram, and this is, um, this is a pointer that um, I share with a lot of folks. I find it really interesting. There's a guy named Justin O'Byrne up in the Bay Area who uh, was really intrigued by the question of, um, why is Google Maps so much better than Apple Maps? I mean, maybe other people's mileage may vary or something like that. But it's kind of a natural question to ask. And he's a cartographer by background. And so he really kind of dug down into that. And what he found was that what Google was doing better than Apple was understanding how to implement this kind of process, okay? Understanding how to do data acquisition and then combine different types of data and do feature acquisition from those to drive the capture and the creation of the kind of data that then fit the answer to the given question. 
And that's sort of the basis that we're trying now to instill in our culture, both in the product management side and in terms of the technology side, the way to think about problems, not as applications, but as data being massaged and factored and brought in from different places to be able to get to the answer that somebody is looking for. So we think about them as something that breaks down into eight simple steps. You know, what's your market that you're going for? What is the use case? How do you define that? What is the data and query specification? Those are things that we begin the process of understanding how to, to get at the, the, the right shape of things. Data acquisition, you know, where do we need to go to be able to get the stuff that we need? And then these steps of data enhancement, data linking, and knowledge graph construction. And I'll get to knowledge graphs here in a second, but that, those three steps there, five, six, and seven, are really the key places in which we see ourselves applying machine learning in terms of building these solutions uh, to provide data solutions to researchers and medical professionals. And the knowledge delivery, essentially, getting that in a place where you're providing a visualization or a query interface for somebody to be able to get the answers in context in a just-in-time fashion. Um, this is a quote from um, Tony Askew, who's the, um, the lead founder at uh, the venture firm that's associated with Relax Group. Um, and I thought, you know, when he uh, said this to me in uh, 2016, I thought, you know, this is, he's really keying into something significant here. Um, how many of you are familiar with the notion of a knowledge graph? I assume that a lot of you are. You know, those of you who are not, it's really a way of packaging data where the primary way of thinking about it is you have nodes, which are, you know, description, you know, they're basically references to entities or things or objects or whatnot. And you have edges, which connect nodes to be able to establish relationships between those things. And I'll show you some examples here in a little bit. But from Tony's point of view, every company that dominates an industry today moving forward is a company that has captured a way to have privileged access to a high quality knowledge graph to drive the business and the value that they're providing to their customers. I don't know if that's consistent with the experience or the, the perspective that, uh, that other people have here, but, but that's the thing that we have focused on and is driving how we're thinking about the application of machine learning uh, in the work that we're doing in Elsevier. So what I want to do now is kind of explain, you know, given that background, what it is specifically we're trying to do and give you some examples. So um, we talk about driving, you know, our business is really delivering what you can think of as better outcomes for people. Um, for the medical uh, practitioner, it's a better outcome for their patients. For researchers, better outcomes in terms of what it is they're striving to to discover in the area of expertise and focus that they have. Um, what we see ourselves as doing is delivering and enabling those better outcomes by giving information in a timely and appropriate fashion for decision making and problem solving. So, you know, sometimes that is, okay, we'll just give somebody a book, but more often than not, we get it to them on their handheld device in a way where they can make a decision in the field. Um, Enhanced discovery and query over massive amounts of information. That's not something that we've done in the past, but increasingly we're getting our, we see ourselves moving into that space because more and more of science and medicine is really about being able to provide people direct access to basic data information that they can then conduct research over. So enabling and building data platforms to allow people to be able to work with the data to come up with scientific advancement as opposed to just essentially waiting for people to do that, having them send us an article and then we bundle it up and print it is a departure for us. But those are the things we're trying to accomplish. But we want to be able to use machine learning to build the knowledge graphs that drive both of those capabilities. You know, first, you know, implementing the sorts of things that you would expect. Entity extraction, relation extraction, sentiment analysis in a very specific way where you're looking for information and clues in the articles about whether or not somebody thinks a particular kind of research is good or not, as an example. And doing that on top of three main sources of information, the scientific and medical literature itself in its full-blown, messy textual glory, um, experimental data, which increasingly 
people are beginning to store and have us manage for them. And the actual data exhaust associated with the traditional publishing process itself. Publishers, you know, receiving contributions, you know, content from authors, the peer review process, uh, citation as it happens, all of that is the business of doing science, is data that can be mined to better understand what, sci what, what the science is as opposed to just essentially um, what the, uh, the sort of reputation management aspect of doing publishing has been traditionally. So those are the three things that we're trying to combine. Um, so I wanted to spend a little time, and I realize I've been rambling here, so how am I doing on uh, Okay, fair enough. Um, by talking about where we are in this whole process. Now this has been going on for a number of years. I mean, I'm sure everybody here has been involved in implementing various types of systems. I mean, we've all been using machine learning in one way or another. It's evolved rapidly, obviously, but um, we started in earnest back in 2015, 2016. And so I want to talk a little bit about some early wins. Things we did that are in production now that established confidence in the utility of that as a technology and a capability that we're now beginning to take a look at how those things turn into what are called roof shots. Now, how many of you folks are familiar with this roof shot, moon shot terminology? Okay, let me just, I think it came from Google. I don't know. But um, a roof shot is a thing where, okay, what you need to do is you need to get somebody on the roof of the building, okay? And it's like, well, all right, it's gonna take some work, but I obviously see that we've got some ladders lying around and we can kind of put it together. We can get somebody up there. Getting them down may be another issue, but. Um, so roof shot is something that is near term, is practically implementable. You can get your, you can see your way to it. A moon shot is something that is a great deal of risk associated with, may be a thing that you may fail out a number of times and may never succeed at, but has a tremendous potential to be truly disruptive to what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And in between those things, you've got practical stuff that you need to do. People have to know how to work with the technology. You have to have the infrastructure. You have to understand how it works with your processes and so forth. So I want to kind of break these down and, and give a little picture of where we are as a company with respect to this. And I'm not holding us out as necessarily um, at the vanguard, okay? But this is, I think, a useful you know, use case to look at in terms of a large company that is not a traditional technology company trying to turn itself into one by adopting these technologies judiciously. So this is a, a, an early example of uh, an application which um, is focused on making it easier to get value out of a key product that we have called clinical, clinical key. Clinical key is kind of the main reference management access interface for people in hospitals or in medical research facilities who are trying to look in the medical literature that, uh, that we're publishing. Um, and you know, it's really targeted towards helping a doctor find what the right treatment is for a particular patient and how to go about and deal with that. Um, through most of its history, it's really been kind of basically a traditional vanilla search engine. Okay, type in a query, you're gonna get a bunch of hits back for articles and books. We may segment them by the kind of thing that they are and so forth. But when um, the, um, the product manager folks went out and talked to the customers, they found uh, that there was a real usability issue and that what the doctor really wants to see is not a pointer to an article that they then have to read, okay? They're dealing with some situation, they gotta make a decision. They want a direct pointer into the thing in that article that tells them exactly what to do. And typically those things are represented as decision flow diagrams within the medical literature. You know, actual charts that kind of walk you through the process of, well, has he got this? Is he bleeding out on the floor? Yada, 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 do this. So what we did was, we actually took a look at using some of the, you know, maybe it's about two or three years back technology associated with image recognition using convolutional neural networks. Um, and actually, you know, this is an early example of an application of transfer learning. So we took one of the published models trained on ImageNet 
uh, and lopped off the top of it and trained it to recognize certain types of diagrams within an article. Okay, and because we had the article database at hand and we could easily identify you know, a, a reasonable training set to go at it, we basically trained on those examples you know, with the usual kind of you know, variations through rotation, flipping, transposing, and the like. Um, and it turned out to be a very quick win. We were able to, uh, you know, with, um, with a, a trained test set of uh, you know, 10,000 images, you know, the test set you know, accuracy that we got to is 93%, which is pretty good, okay? And basically all that thing is doing is going through the content as it's being published on clinical key, indexing pointers to those instances with the articles that come back and just surfacing those within the, um, the user interface so that when somebody does the search, gets those references back, there's a bit that says, okay, here's where you go to to get those, those flow diagrams. Simple, stupid, but very impactful in terms of the usability of that application for people who are trying to get a particular kind of task done. Another early win, very similarly, is building what are called topic pages for our ScienceDirect product. ScienceDirect is the main search interface into the literature that we provide in the context of journal articles and books. Um, and you know, the, what, the page that you see there in the middle is typically what you'll see when you get back a pointer to a given article. You know, title, the abstract, you know, you can scroll through that. There's all sorts of, you know, uh, web page wizardry to kind of make different aspects of the article come to life. Um, but what we didn't have was an ability to capture the kinds of things that you see typically now in a Google search or a Bing search or whatnot, where you type in the name of an entity and you get alongside that specific metadata that's focused on that, the properties and the attributes and the relationship to that particular entity. So we're trying to play catch up there and the question is how to do that. And in effect, what we we're trying to do was within the literature find information that was exposed as critical entities within an article and then go out and try to classify sections of relevant articles for that particular topic, find snippets, find definitional sentences that we could then automatically compose as a particular topic page. So that approach, again, uh, you know, we took a deep learning approach to be able to tackle that where we used a variety of different features, uh, the original sentence text, uh, you know, part of speech sequence, um, you know, the original sentence marked up uh, with concepts that are occurring in Wikipedia and combine those together um, in, um, you know, in the way that people are building these kinds of language uh, inference sorts of applications in a stack that uh, allowed us to do actually pretty well uh, in terms of, uh, you know, for example, the F1 score, about 95.8% in terms of identifying things that were snippets that were relevant to pull into a topic page or the definition of a thing and the like. So again, trying to use machine learning to accelerate our ability to work with the content we already have in a relatively semi-structured form and add value to make it easier for people to be able to gain access to the information that they were looking for. Given the confidence that we've gained in those early wins, we're now starting to take a look at things that I would consider as roof shots, okay? Um, this is an example which is, uh, I'll go into in a little bit of detail here, which is really about this building the knowledge graph for helping people deal with medical information. So this is an example of, a, of, of, this is an example of the kind of information we're working from. Uh, this is a book uh, that you can buy from us, uh, 500 plus pages on differential diagnosis. And so there's a very standard way in which these things are written, okay? This is not typically, you know, unstructured free text where somebody's sort of talking about a whole ramble of things. They have a very simple structure. It's largely text inside there, but you can key off the structure to be able to get information necessary to be able to kind of pull that together into a knowledge graph sort of framework. Uh, but the challenge we have is buried within that literature, there are statements that aren't necessarily that structured. Okay, so 
this is a, you know, a typical sentence that you're going to find in clinical literature. You know, three clinical symptoms are considered to be highly suggestive of pulmonary embolism, of which P is the uh, contraction, um, and then you can read the rest of that. But what we want to do is be able to capture that as a piece of the knowledge graph that relates those two entities with the has clinical finding relationship. So, um, you know, again, we took a couple of different technologies we had at hand. We have a product from a company that we acquired long ago in the, in the 2000s called Lexalytics, um, called the fingerprint engine. It's a very kind of traditional bag of words, statistical topic classification kind of approach. We use that to do semantic tagging of various aspects of uh, content in the literature. Um, and then we did syntactic tagging, you know, really essentially doing parsing of the sentence in terms of the major components of it uh, using a combination, you know, using Spacey and uh, using Apache Spark to scale that out. That would then give us a set of features that once again we brought into um, a convolutional neural network, uh, which, um, you know, as opposed to some of the earlier uh, systems which we implemented in uh, uh, things like CAFE or Torch, this was implemented in Keras, um, where, you know, we pulled out candidate relations and we embedded this in a system where we coupled that with mechanical Turk to do validation of what was coming out of that so that we could then build and maintain a gold set uh, for us to be able to validate that. So that's work underway uh, that is really targeted towards building this kind of system. Uh, we call the, um, the knowledge graph that we're building within the, um, the healthcare technologies group uh, HGraph. And the idea is that through this combination of machine learning enhanced NLP, we're building a core which then becomes the scaffolding over which we can begin to integrate all of the different data sets that we have uh, either built over time or acquired. Some of those data sets are simple medical taxonomies and ontologies. Others are very, very specific things like the drug database that comes from our gold standard product. Information associated with radiology images. The idea is that we use the learning to mine the literature to then build the, the data integration framework for us to be able to pull these things together. And that then begins to put us in a position to break down the silos that we've struggled against as we've tried to work with expanding the capabilities and um, you know, the, the, the power of the applications we have over time. We're putting things in a place where we can make it easy to integrate across different sources of information using the knowledge graph as a central framework. Mike? I will get to that. Hold that thought. Uh, the question was, how does this compare to deep QA? And I will be explicit about that in a moment. Um, this is an example of kind of a browser for the information that's being generated uh, off of the HGraph thing. And you can kind of see this bit about where now we've got the ability on an entity-centric way to be able to dive down into the knowledge we're mining out of the content and be able to explore things along a different set, you know, different sets of relationships. So are these symptoms? What are the diagnostic procedures, drugs, and treatments? And now emerging out of this is something that is not that far from something that is directly usable by end users. Okay, this was originally built as an, as an engineering lash up to just say, oh, well, what does the knowledge graph actually look like and comprise? But it's actually very close to something that's directly usable. And the beauty of the way that this has been built on top of these technologies is that now people are using the APIs to be able to build and integrate data independently. Whereas in the past, we've kind of been forced to work with you know, a combination of sneaker net and trying to beg, borrow, and steal data sets from people. Now it's all exposed in this knowledge graph that we're increasingly mining out of the literature itself. Another roof shot, kind of coming back to work with image classification and image and object recognition. Um, I mentioned very briefly, one of the data sources that was in that last slide uh, is from a company called Amersys that we acquired. Uh, there's an application that they have called StatDX, which is one of the primary ways in which radiologists share pathology imagery um, and, and work with it. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of work, and you've seen it particularly out of places like Stanford and work they've done with Google and so forth on, you know, doing 
image interpretation for diagnosis of things like cancer and so forth. Um, all of that is kind of driven out of you know, traditional annotated raw images. But when we went to the StatDX guys and said, what do you got? They didn't have that. <laughs> what they had was, in the, you know, what, what they had combined with the literature is we have a lot of images that have text associated with them because that's what at ends up getting published, right? You got a picture, it's like, here, this is a picture of this and this is what you, know, you see and you've got arrows in there. So what we've been trying to do is work with a combination, again, of these convolutional approaches to, to, to image recognition and you know, simple recurrent unit interpreting the caption information, the information, the text contextually around that to then drive the ability to come up with better and better segmentation of the image and the ability to be able to say what it is that actually is being segmented out of that image. Again, work that's ongoing, but one that the idea is to provide assistance to medical professionals like pathologists in interpreting the information. Not necessarily to make the diagnosis itself, but to kind of pull that all through. A couple things about then, you know, so that's what we have done, the quick wins we got, um, some of the things we're working on now. But there's other things around this that we're trying to really understand how to scale our ability to use this uh, technology in anger. One is uh, working on building um, workflows that make sense. Now there are two here that I wanted to share. The one on the left is work that's being done by our precision medicine team to be able to take EHR data and information and build various kinds of classifiers on that in a data science fashion. And what they've been doing is trying to understand how to lash up various things coming out of you know, the AWS service area, you know, staging things in, a, in an S3 hosted data lake, um, applying EMR and Apache Spark to that to be able to work with the training set, automatically partition it into the various kinds of test and train um, uh, batches. Um, and then use the Amazon SageMaker tool, which we've been evaluating and getting a lot of uh, mileage out of, to be able to, to, to work with building the finer model and having all of that uh, basically being done through notebook interfaces. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff that we're trying to use is really not quite off the shelf yet. That's probably coming. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in the audience who've had this experience as well. It's like, kind of have to, we're still having to build some stuff around to make the technology usable in the fashion that would allow us to be able to produce this. Um, on the right side, this is, the, this is the, the lash up in a slightly different detail associated with the, uh, the H-graph uh, relationship extraction system that I was showing you earlier. But really, you know, with the understanding of what we're trying to do is, as part of the work, produce a gold set, manage that, and have subject matter experts be constantly in the loop in a continuous fashion as we build and deploy models uh, to validate what's going on there. Another key thing for us is really training the people who are actually going to be using this technology. Um, there's only a fraction of the technology group of 1,200 who have really gained direct hands-on experience with machine learning technologies. How do we begin to scale that up? Um, so we're beginning to get people into a training program. Right now we're leveraging courses from Udemy to be able to bring them through kind of a judo belt mechanism to get them exposed to you know, the basic technologies in a way where they can consume it and try not to do that in a way which overloads them in terms of, you know, I've got a day job, don't tell me to take another 40 hours of course work in the evening. You know, that's, that's the, the stuff in Udemy is carved up in a way that makes it uh, better for that than some other providers. And you know, we're now establishing OKRs to essentially say, look, this is what we want to do, how far we want to get with regard to getting people in a position to use this day by day creatively, no matter what it is they're doing across the technology group. And then finally, in terms of practicality, um, you know, each of those steps that I showed earlier, sort of the eight steps in terms of how we think about building these data solutions, um, has an associated set of technologies uh, for which you see examples. And I know this is painfully uh, small font, so I won't ask people to kind of have try to read that from the audience. But you know, in essence, we're in a constant process of trying to understand based on the feedback. We have a very large organization 
And it's not easy to herd cats so that they're all using one thing in any given selection. But we are having the benefit of being able to gather information about a host of different solutions potentially. And then slowly through a review process, put ourselves in a position to apply effective governance to kind of urge people in the right directions uh, in this vein. So a couple quick things about moonshots. And I know I'm coming close to the end here. Um, so this is gonna be quick. Um, I won't spend too much time on this one, but this one was so sweet. We didn't actually deploy this anywhere, but I love this application. Again, this is taking the literature and a subject taxonomy and using matrix factorization in the sense that people use that traditionally in building uh, content recommendation systems to do, text, uh, to do extraction of concepts using what in effect is um, open information extraction. So here this is a bunch of facts on the right hand side about glaucoma that we know about and then a whole range of facts that we discovered uh, out of this without really going to the extent that we did in some of these other systems of having to, to learn you know, explicit language knowledge. But this is an example of an experiment that we did within our labs group a few years back that again gave us the confidence that there were ways to be able to solve this problem, kind of tackle this thing. But the thing that we really need to crack in terms of a moonshot is, you know, kind of getting back to the question that was asked earlier, is really get to a generic set of capabilities that allow us to tackle question answering. This is a quote from Richard Socher here, who is a currently at Facebook, um, which, you know, it's a classic technologist thing, right? If I got a hammer, I want to have everything be a nail, okay? But he's saying that, like, look, if you have a good way to do question answering against text, you actually have a solution that will do a wide range of language processing tasks and decision support kinds of things just right off the bat, you just phrase the question the right way and the answer you get back is the thing that you're looking towards. So that's something we're really actively investigating. Um, I don't know if this, uh, how, many, how many people out there can understand what this meme is in reference to? Okay, this is, this is actually, so we're, we're exploring this technology that came out of uh, Google called BERT, right? Uh, it's a particular approach out of this family of algorithms that are originally called uh, transformer style architectures. Um, that's Bert in the background and what uh, the NLP researcher is looking at is there's a, like just the other week, uh, OpenAI released another system called GPT-2, which blew Bert away in terms of state of the art and so forth. So this is a thing that I think we're all beginning to learn and be familiar with. It's like so much is happening so fast that it's hard to keep track and it's very easy to get distracted with all of this. Um, but we have some questions with regard to whether these technologies, how easy it is to just do the transfer style learning of these technologies against scientific and medical information. The, the, the issue is kind of open uh, for us at this point with the results that we're getting. So that's kind of the moonshot stuff. Um, I'm going to go quick here. So, you know, all of that was about using machine learning to be able to add value and capability to applications for people to use. But there's a real hidden opportunity for us as a publisher here, which is that, as we know, or as a lot of us are probably convinced of, it's all about the data. The algorithms are commodity, the data is very dear. And being in a position to be able to provide a way to commission, author, curate that data for the purposes of helping people build models is an opportunity I think that, uh, that I would love our company to take advantage of in the not too distant future. Because, and this is a, this is a thing that I've been kind of working under as a kind of a, a, a hypothesis. As the capabilities through technologies like BERT and GDP, GPT-2 continue to advance, the burden of effort in building these kinds of machine intelligence applications is going to shift from software engineering and creation of new architectures to the curation of the data that feeds those things for the given particular applications. So it's a shift that we need to take a look at. As a consequence, scholarly publishing in the next 20 years may be as much about publishing data for machines as it is publishing content for people. You know, content for people brings knowledge to them, delivers it in a way where they can use that in their daily lives and their jobs. 
doing that for machines puts us in a position to build models that can flow and understand that, increase our understanding from a data science perspective as well as be a functional part of a broader system that's helping augment and automate information. Okay, so this is the bit I need to go through in like two minutes. Okay, but I wanna switch gears here for a second and just you know, talk a little bit about you know, kind of a personal perspective here. Um, I'm an old guy and <laughs> have been around a, a number of years and have actually seen a couple of waves of AI you know, in the broader sense, not just machine learning, but expert systems and so forth kind of come and go. And, you know, I was recently put in a position where I went up to a workshop uh, that Ed Feigenbaum of Stanford put together at the uh, Computer uh, Museum up in, uh, up in the Bay Area. And he brought together a bunch of people from the expert systems era. And he sort of said, what happened, right? And we were in a room with a bunch of historians and a bunch of guys taking video, kind of like, you know, getting an oral history of this whole thing. It was a combination. Of, it was like a cross between a reunion and a deposition, right? Because the thing, because the big question was, okay, you guys did all this great stuff in the 80s with expert systems. Like, what happened? Why does your industry no longer exist? Okay. It's a painful question to consider. Um, so I kind of thought about that a little bit. You know, some things are the same between back then in an initial peak of enthusiasm for AI and, uh, and today. Uh, weirdly, there are fetish like objects in the ways of you know, expensive hardware devices, okay? Back then it was list machines, now it's you know, GPUs and TPUs. Um, you have really expensive people. Today it's data scientists, back then it was the notion of a knowledge engineer, okay? Even weirder, there always has to be some sort of geopolitical angle on this, okay? Like, who are we, you know, in a race with? Okay, back then it was Japan, now it's China. But some things are very, very different, right? You look at the number of computers that are out there that are all connected, okay, what are we, seven orders of magnitude larger, by my accounting here? Um, processing is up five orders of magnitude in terms of speed. How many, you know, bits a US dollar can buy you? has you know, dropped by five orders, you know, what's that? Yeah, it's five orders of magnitude. I mean, this is tremendously transformational in that sense. So you know, it's a world where, you know, compared to when I started in the mid 80s, okay, is dramatically different. It is so much easier to build stuff and people are sharing it. Stuff is being published. I go to a GitHub repository, I see the code. Okay, stuff goes up on archive. Okay, it comes through on Twitter. Our ability to move this technology is so much faster. Um, it's tremendous. Uh, but, you know, we're starting to see some hints of the kind of thing that, you know, traditionally signaled sort of a shifting of momentum, kind of the, the beginning of uh, a winter, to use that term. A lot of what we're using in these technologies has really been about enhanced machine perception. There's not been a lot of work that has really focused on or made a lot of progress on machine reasoning. The exemplar of one of the greatest things, and this is a truly striking advance of AlphaGo and AlphaZero and so forth, is really wedding some elements of this new level of machine learning and deep learning technologies with some really traditional old school search and, 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 and problem solving kinds of architectures. Um, while these things are cheaper and easier to build, we're starting to run into the unexpected consequences of applying them. You know, self-driving cars looked like that was going to happen really quick. Okay, maybe not so much now, or at least people are starting to put the brakes on that as they begin to think about what it means for a robot to make a decision about whether somebody lives or not. Um, we're starting to see the beginning of adversarial techniques to fool things. Um, which would be potentially a vector for fraud or you know, other kinds of ways of manipulating data in, an you know, in, a, in a bad way. So, um, and we're also kind of you know, beginning to see the end of Moore's Law, so we're not gonna be as quick to be able to just ride off of the advance in, 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 in hardware performance. And oh yeah, IBM Watson. I, because I'm short on time, I'm not going to begin that rant. Okay.
but we'll come back to that sometime. You can ask me later. Should we be worried? Um, you know, the expert systems error was perceived as a failure. The systems we built were brittle, okay? But at the same time, if you go back and you look at the things we have in our pockets, like Siri and so forth, they were all rooted in the technology and the work that was done back then. Maybe the issue really is just understanding the appropriate time frame with doing really, really hard problems. Uh, speech recognition is an example. 1970 was kind of the era when all that began. Um, today, we assume a level of capability that was what those guys were thinking of as the ultimate goal, okay? And we've forgotten about the fact that that was an AI application then. Um, I'll tell you a story about Mark Raybert's leg lab another time, but in any case, you know, same thing with robots. Um, artificial general intelligence, it's a really hard problem, okay? I don't expect us to be able to make progress on that anytime soon, although other people in the audience may differ. Um, but, you know, what we really should be focused on here is, is, is really what do we need to do to get really good, solid, short-term results? Um, and lay, put, lay the foundation for the medium term, essentially the moonshots. Um, always working backward from real customer needs to define an application. That is the principal mistake that the IBM Watson people made. Okay. You, again, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of lifting that needs to be done, data acquisition and quality. And that has to be dealt with first before you can really make any progress in this. I'm sure data scientists around the, the room will agree with me on that. Um, and we have to design applications to mitigate brittleness. And I think the most important part of this is thinking by default, okay, use simple approaches. You understand how they behave. Use logistic regression when that will do as opposed to firing up some 20 level or 20 layer thing. Um, augmentation before automation. Build systems that can partner with people to make good decisions as opposed to replace them, as, a, as, a, as an example. And then leverage the differentiating strengths. For us, that's our content, our deep subject matter expertise. Those are the things that we can use as advantage com in combination with the technology to be able to deliver value. So, to sum up, um, talked a little bit about our focus on knowledge graphs and how critical machine learning is to scaling our ability to work with and produce that kind of information. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we're doing. I mean, there's a host of applications I didn't talk about. Um, I probably talked about too many as it get, goes, but uh, um, you know, there's a lot of work underway, but there's a tremendous amount left to do. And I think we're really only beginning with this, particularly as it relates to topics like question answering. That's it. Appreciate your time. Um, is it so? We have time for a few questions. I don't think it's my time, but that's okay. Oh, okay. We have time for a few questions, so I'll pass the mic around for questions. Hi. Um, I just would like to. Uh, actually, I would like to hear a little bit of the Watson rant, and. <laughs> And as well, uh, find out a little bit about psych and how uh, it, it relates, if, it, if at all it does. Sure. Um, okay, so the Watson rant. I mean, the, the, the thing about Watson was, Watson, the thing that was built originally by Dave Ferrucci, was a great application that brought together a lot of things to solve a very specific task, which was answering Jeopardy questions. <laughs> okay. What, what happened was that that got turned into a marketing thing. And I had the opportunity to go to Yorktown Heights and sit down with the Watson people. They used a lot of our content very specifically to be able to build some of the applications that they were building for Sloan Kettering and for um, the uh, Cancer Center in Texas. Um, and they were all a little bit sheepish about that as well. Um, so there was this kind of misdirection thing going on. You know, Watson, the question answering system, really has no relationship to the various things that are branded with the Watson brand. And now it's obvious to everybody. But for a period there, they're like having, you know, talking 
lights, you know, speaking to people on TV and whatnot, and it just completely is an egregious example of the abuse and, and, and inappropriate hype for, for, for AI, okay? And it bit them, honestly. Um, and it's a shame because that kind of approach that was embodied in the original system for question answering combined with deep learning technology, as we're now starting to see in things like you know, the work in BERT, GPT-2, and so forth, I think is tremendously powerful. Combining symbolic approaches to information fusion and answer selection, you know, using things like engines to go out and get relevant snippets and then have that thing read it is a tremendously powerful technique. But that all got lost in the marketing shuffle. And now we're looking at a thing where nobody knows what, what that is. And I think to some extent that, that damages, I don't know if you want to call it the brand of AI, but you know, it's not a good thing because people will say, well, what about this? Um, you know, when people begin to get concerned about you know, the downsides. So that wasn't very eloquent, but I'm, I'm not particularly uh, happy about that. I guess the other thing uh, with regard to psych, I did at this thing that I mentioned uh, up in um, the Bay Area, have an opportunity to talk to Doug, Doug Lennett and get a look into what he's doing. I mean, it's kind of continuing to plug along, right? Now, you talk to Doug, and I don't know how many people here have ever heard Doug speak, but Doug will talk you know, about the various things that are now ongoing. He built what was a knowledge graph. It was very focused on sort of very compartmentalized logical theories that you could use to reason about certain topic matters to come up with a notion of what is the common sense thing to deduce in a given way. Right now he's claiming that they've now gotten to the point where they have something that is useful for enterprises in automating certain kinds of tasks in a truly scalable way. Now I haven't been down to Austin to really see if that's the case. Um, you know, I think, you know, Doug's been playing the long game for you know quite some time, and uh, you know, and as I said, you know, in the presentation, some of these things and problems like that are they're going to take decades to solve, and you know, maybe that's what it's going to take, and maybe that will come out of Psych eventually, but I don't know. More questions? Thanks for your talk. <clears throat> um, you, on one of your slides, you were talking about the need for content curation, and you had like an image of a researcher kind of submitting his test data there. Is uh, something you guys are considering is have researchers submit negative test results? Um, or is that kind of outside of the scope of the systems that well, you guys have two been building? Well, there's two things there. One, one of the things we're starting to do is work on building cap capabilities to support the part of the research process that, around gathering experimental data, whether it's like through lab notebooks or just allowing people to be able to store and query raw experimental data itself, have that be something. We've started some journals that are really about, okay, not submitting articles, but submitting data sets and putting those things into a framework where you can begin to get the sort of, um, you know, benefit of sharing them in that kind of way. Those are all very, you know, that's kind of experimental. But, you know, the, the issue about negative results and building journals around that, um, we would love, you know, we, we love when people come to us and try to say, how can we work and begin to change the journal publishing system to be able to deal with those sorts of things, which can be a big part of a solution to reproducibility and fraud in science. Um, but it's very difficult to get traction there. And to a large extent, I think, that is due to kind of the, the whole scholarly ecosystem and the way that thing is built together. There's institutions, there's individual researchers, there's funding agencies, and over decades, if you even want to go back centuries, they've built a particular way of thinking about what constitutes quality published scientific material and how does somebody get credit for that. And there's a lot of people with a lot of great ideas about how to change that, but it's an ecosystem and a set of institutions that is changing very, very slowly. So, you know, I think that's a, it's, it's a, it's a great idea that people are kind of chipping away at the edges of. Um, but it's, I mean, I've been, you know, I'm neither a scientist nor a publisher, and yet somehow I've spent the last 10 years working as a scientific publisher.
I, it's an amazingly complex um, thing to deal with, and it's big, right? Um, it's hard to wrap your head around. Um, there's tremendous opportunity for people to advance, and people are beating their head against the wall in terms of trying to get to the kinds of speeds that we see in the consumer internet and have that happen. And, you know, there's two ways to think about that. People are slow, they're Luddites, you know, it's a old boys network, all the things you can bring to bear and all that. But on the other hand, these are institutions that are centuries old in some cases. And that's the way they work and there's a reason for the way they work and maybe that is a break against, you know, some other things that are going on there. It's a great question. Um, we welcome those kinds of ideas, how to chip away at that. And right now we're going to be, you know, probably for the next 20 years in this kind of Cambrian era of people just throwing stuff up on the wall and seeing if it takes uh, to try to come up with a new way of doing scientific communication that works. Uh, I don't think anybody anywhere can honestly look at, articulate what that's going to be today. I'm actually going to ask a question. I have a question about BERT. So one of the uh, real powers of transfer learning is this the ability to take knowledge from one domain and use it in another. I've heard a lot of startups in medical literature talk about how that just doesn't exist for medicine. Like all the pre-trained networks are on Wikipedia or Google News. You guys are in a unique position to publish pre-trained word embeddings or, or, or BERT models for BERT for that particular use case and actually open source the weights themselves. Yes. Have you guys considered doing that? We have. Um, and that's a thing that we have yet to work through in a way which makes sense. I mean, this idea of us providing things like models in that fashion is new. Mm -hmm. And we've yet to get the results internally on top of those sorts of technologies to sort of say, okay, well, here's how we could actually pencil this business opportunity out, right? Uh, I was just on a call today about the evaluation that's ongoing with the team in our labs group. Um, it's using, actually, there is a thing called BioBERT that is a, got a pre-trained model against some aspect of the biomedical literature. So we're right now, as we speak, in the middle of really trying to understand whether there is a there there, okay? And, but let's be optimistic and say that it actually does happen and it really is going to take and like some couple, three generations forward, you know, there's, there's, there's something very nice there. Yeah, I mean, I, I would want us to be in a position to, to do that because of our ability to wrangle. Because the thing that we have, and the thing that made us very attractive to IBM, was back when we made the leap from print to digital, people spent an enormous amount of time and effort figuring out how to build XML documents that captured everything, okay? And build all of the quality control and supplier processes around that. And what we ended up with was something that we didn't understand back then, that we now understand deeply, is that it's a tremendous resource for doing this kind of data analytics and processing. Uh, because it's not, you're not just working against things you scraped out of the web or in PDF. It's, there's a lot of knowledge and information just in how that stuff is laid out, right? So it is an opportunity. I'm struggling as hard as I can to get us moving down that path that you're articulating. So, yes. Very thought provoking. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. The question I have is that you as a publisher in private industry could go in that direction, but I'm sure you're well aware that most technical publications and technical papers that are written are uh, coming out of academic world. And if you go to a journal that you just want to publish a data set, how are you going to, you going to resolve the issue of publish or perish and the tenure system and the grant review system and the funding agencies that all the academicians and professors have to deal with in this transfer of in this transformation of approach to scientific advances? Yeah, I mean, that's a tremendous, that is the question. And that's the thing we struggle with because, I mean, I mean some of us here conceive of us as the evil publisher, um, but we're bound in this, you know, fatal embrace with, you know, 
publish or perish and you know the tenure system and impact factor and all this other stuff that's been built up that was built, born in an era when everything was print, right? Okay, and you know again, it's a problem that people, you know, I mean, going back to the first slide I showed, the Forbes era, people thought, internet's here, these guys are toast. No, is that because of us? No, it's because of that whole, that whole ecosystem. And, and there's a lot of change that has to happen in many different facets for us to begin to kind of tackle that problem and to get it to scale. I think just to jump ahead and say how I think this is proceeding or how you know, uh, we're hoping it will proceed is the value proposition that we had as publishers when it was print was indubitable, okay? You had to run the, print pre the printing press, okay? It was like trucks shipping books on, you know, putting, printing stuff out in paper, putting it between pieces of cardboard and sending it out to the library, okay? Scientists didn't want to do that. Now it's digital. Okay, scientists say they can do that. But there is value add there that, you know, there's, you know, continual argument back and forth about whether or not publishers provide value add in that kind of context. I think that the way, the value proposition has to be recast, okay? And it's gonna take, it's taken much longer than people expected. It's gonna take time from here on out. But at the end of the day, there's gonna be a different way of considering the value that we provide. And it really is probably going to be in the form of, you know, if you go back and you think of us as you know, shipping jur bound journals all over the place, we're infrastructure for scientific communication. We will get back to the point where we are the infrastructure provider for scientific communication, but it will be out of the way of the things that are problematic for the community, the issues that are raised by open access and open science and so forth. We have to get back to providing value in a manner that everyone perceives as value. And that's probably going to take some changes in terms of you know, how institutions conduct themselves in terms of reputation management, promotion. And you see it kind of coming together in different areas, you know, from different areas, whether it's a Me Too kind of thing, or you know, there's a lot of change going on in terms of how constituencies who are striving to come up with new ideas and new knowledge are actually breakthrough. Um, and we're not, we're, I mean, I, what I would say is that we're probably the least of <laughs> science and medicine's problems in that regard. But people don't necessarily agree with me on that. Cool. I think we have time for one more. It's all right here. So I'm going to get uh, metaphorical, then literal, then give an example. Um, so no one likes reinventing the wheel. So how do you satisfy a customer that doesn't search for something circular? Uh, I, I'm, I'm asking how do you satisfy someone without, that doesn't give the right keywords? Um, and to give an example, uh, PCA was invented in 1901, or created in 1901, uh, but fluid dynamics created uh, proper orthogonal decomposition later, it's just the time series version of PCA. Why was that reinvented? How can you prevent that in the future? I think, you know, what we're striving to do is make it possible for somebody to wrap their head around as much of what they need to know to do the work they need to do in their area. In as, efficient a in as efficient a manner as possible. Now this is in the face of a dramatic explosion by any measure of the volume of science that's being produced. Um, I'm worried about the quality of that science because I think a lot of the things that have happened with you know, fake news and so forth have their own analogs in scientific publishing and so forth. But that aside, the, the challenge is how do you make it possible for somebody to ask the right questions, it's particularly challenging because increasingly the work that's being funded by funders and so forth is truly interdisciplinary. So somebody gets trained in a particular thing, they go to a, uh, an institution that's great for that sort of a thing, they come out as an expert in X, but then the next thing they need to do is come up to speed on Y as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. 
And I don't know if we have necessarily the tools or the systems really to, to, to address specifically this issue that you're raising. We have techniques that increasingly are decoupling the literal expression of the words in a query from the idea that it can call forth. As we move more towards knowledge representations that are implicit in deep learning, through distributional semantics and so forth, we're starting to get the opportunity to kind of begin to make those leaps into you know, things that aren't terminologically the same, but from you know, the context they are. But that's an incremental improvement in addressing the thing that you're talking about, which I think is a huge challenge. Um, because there's just so much to know out there. And there's only so much time that each of us has. And, you know, uh, you know again, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's going to be one of these things that's going to be a problem across the generations that hopefully we'll be able to chip away at. And I do believe that, you know, some of these things associated with, um, that are coming out of things like BERT and similar kinds of work uh, are providing clues as to how to, to get machines to really help us get to the right information for what it is we're trying to do at any given point in time. <laughs> so we're going to have to end it there. Uh, we have the room for another 20 minutes. Let's thank Brad again. Thank you, Brad. Very much appreciate the time and attention. And we'll get this posted on Meetup, so look for the video. Thank you. <laughs>